talk about fears well, Let's talk about Monday. Monday is solved or unsolved. Today we're going to be looking at the case of Carrie Colberson. She was a missing person from Blanchester, Ohio. She went missing August 28, 1996. Now why this case? Why, why look at this for a week? There's been an arrest. There's been a conviction. But there's been no body. So this case is is one of the very first cases that I've got interested in actually physically um, kind of investigating the case before I became a cop. I don't know why this case stuck with me when I saw it, I believe, on American Justice. I believe that's the name of the show with Bill Curtis. But it did. I'm sure a lot of you people have that same feelings. You know, you watch a specific case or something and you're like, Man, it just sticks with you, and you're always looking for updates and such. Well, this was the first case for me that I kind of investigated. And I say kind of because I wasn't a cop. I was going to college at the time for my criminal justice degree. Um, I'd, I'd already been out of the Marine Corps. So I started digging, and I started contacting people, and I had never done that before. And... I actually wrote a letter to the suspect in this case. So it was one of the first ones that I was just involved in. And I wanted to take another look at it. And I wanted you guys to see it. And, and I want to get your opinions on what you think happened on this case. So if you're not familiar with it, I mean, it's not like some of those other cases that I've looked at throughout the this series as it's not famous at all right it's hardly anybody knows about it certainly people more people know about it than the Don Miller case that we had done a few weeks ago I mean apparently uh, if Bill Curtis did a show on it on American Justice and I believe it was Paula Zahn had done a case on it too or a TV show but Carrie Colberson was a very attractive brunette, uh, 22 years old, cheerleader, uh, volleyball player from Blanchester, Ohio. Like I said, population was about 4,200 people. So a small town about 30, 35 uh, miles outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Victimology will pay, play a role in this, as will suspectology. We're going to look at that. Um, as you know, victimology is very important to me, and I think it should be important to all investigators. What would a person do in a certain situation, fight or flight? Look at the background and the relationship history, if there is any. In this case, she had a boyfriend of a few years named Vince Doan. Now, Vince Doan, everybody knew Vince Doan, a small town. Him and his father and their family ran a towing company. That's going to play a key role in this. Um, Vince was 24 at the time, so he was two years older than Carrie. They came from different sides of the track. Everybody couldn't understand what she saw in him. Two different socioeconomic backgrounds, two very different and diverse personalities, but somehow they got together, and we'll get into that because relationships obviously play a key role in what is going on in somebody's mind 
So we have victimology. We have suspectology. Now, what else about suspectology? You don't just have one suspect in this case. Most people think you do. But there's going to be a couple other theories. And that she ran away, started a new life. Let's make one thing clear. Carrie Culberson has never been found. Her body has never been found. Yes, there was an arrest. Yes, there was a conviction. But was it the right thing to do on behalf of the justice system? Beyond the, the prosecution, did they do the right thing? in arresting and convicting Vince Doan. On what evidence? When you don't have a body, it's very difficult. When there's no evidence, circumstantial is all you got. But was there enough circumstantial there in order to get a conviction? Obviously there was, but was it the right choice? We'll get into the trial of Vince Doan. Corruption. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big corruption type of guy. Like, you know, I get emails all the time and comments from people that uh, the police officer is corrupt. Law enforcement is corrupt. Um, yeah, well, on general, that that's not true. That's my opinion. However... I'm not naive enough to think that it doesn't happen, because it does. In this case, I believe that corruption played a role in why Carrie Culberson's body was never found. And that's going to be important. And we're also going to look into the reasoning for not only somebody going missing, but for homicides. As I've always said, it's either mostly revenge, jealousy, or sex. Those three co key components. Uh, we'll get into which one this one possibly could be. But could Carrie Culberson still be alive? There's people on Vince Doan's behalf that certainly say that. There was witnesses that said they've seen her driving her car out of town. Not only did Carrie go missing, but her car is missing. And that's important as well. Could this be a case of, let's say, Carrie Mae Parker. That case was recently solved. I was hired to consult on that case many years ago, before I wrote this book. And there's a chapter in this book about Carrie Mae Parker. I had, she had gone missing and her car. Everyone suspected the boyfriend. In fact, he was saw, seen digging a big hole in his backyard previous to her disappearance. He said it was for a septic system. Other people said it was to hide a car and hide a body. When I got the case and I looked at it, based on victimology, based off of geography, and where Carrie Mae was coming and going from, and St. Patrick's Day, and the time of night, knowing through victimology that she was a bad driver, I suggested the route that she had taken that night, which had bodies of water on both sides of the road, that that's where they ought to look. Because I didn't see much with the boyfriend. I believe that she probably went off of the road and submerged her car and ultimately passed away by drowning in her car. 30 years later, they find her. They find her car right off of that same road that I suggested. Now, why do I say that? Is it to toot my own horn? No. It's to show that foul play is not always involved in these cases. You have to look at victimology. You have to look at the totality of everything. So could that be the same in this Carrie Culberson case? Is foul play for sure. So we'll get into that, and I'll give you my opinion. We talked about no body. A no body case is very difficult, especially back in 1997 when this case went to trial. Uh, not so much anymore. It's becoming more common. 
but the prosecution had their work cut out for them. We're going to talk about timelines in this case, which is obviously very important in any missing persons case. We're also going to look at witnesses and witness statements. That's a catch-22. More convictions have been overturned based on erroneous eyewitness testimony than DNA. I do take in consideration eyewitness testimony, but you really have to drill down deep into it and find out if there's a motive for it, um, could they have been mistaken, their background, do they have a history of lying for reasons, you talk to their family and friends and, and you find out all these things. So witness statements in this case are crucial. So you have to you have to figure out are they believable. So we're going to look at those witness statements. I'm going to put in a link, you know, to some some reading material for you to read up on this case as we go forward by the time we get to Wednesday and the deep dive. That way you know and you start formulating your opinions as what you think may have happened to Carrie and see if it matches what I come up with on Wednesday. Now, of course, Tuesday we're going to have the key clue. You know, what did I see in this case that steered me in the direction of solved or unsolved and who may or may not be responsible? What was it, you know, that said, aha, the aha moment, you know, this is it. Um, that's very important. There's a lot of things in this case that trouble me as an investigator. Obviously, so much so that it stuck with me. You know, I, I was in law enforcement for 15 years, 16 years. And I've been out of law enforcement now for, I think, three years. So 18 years, this case has stuck with me. Because remember, I got interested in this case before I got into law enforcement and before I became a detective and a cold case detective. So I still remember this case. And I actually, I remember receiving an email from Carrie's mom, uh, Deborah Culberson, who's a fierce advocate and uh, for doing the, the right thing and for missing persons, pe missing persons to be taken seriously and for law enforcement doing their job correctly. Now, if I remember correctly, Mrs. Culberson ended up suing Blanchester Police Department and I believe won a large sum of money. Now, we'll get into that too. Was that warranted? Um, we'll see. You know, I got my opinions on that as well. But I remember getting an email from her because I must have reached out to her, you know, back in probably 2002 would be my guess, uh, offering my help, whatever I could do. And I didn't have any experience at the time. I had a natural curiosity and I had the passion for investigations. But I remember getting something back from her and I don't recall what it was. It, um, it was nice, um, but I, I remember that. And like I said, I remember writing an email to Vince Doan, or not an email, I believe it was a it was a letter. Never got a response. Did get a response from one of his relatives, which was not very nice. And I'll get into that more on Wednesday as well. This is another case we're gonna look at domestic violence. Think of Jeffrey McDonald. Think of Chris Watts. Uh, think of O.J. Simpson. Think of Natalie Wood. What do all those cases have in common? Domestic violence. Gabby Petito. Domestic violence. People sometimes underestimate the 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 rage, the the passion, the angst. And how emotional domestic violences are. 
as a police officer, they are the most dangerous situation to go in because emotions run so high. Traffic stops were always the most dangerous as you don't know what's going to happen because you don't know what that person just did. He could have just committed a murder. And here he runs a red light and you're pulling him over and approaching him. Domestic violence is much the same way. You're going into a situation, you're an outsider going into somebody's home where they feel comfortable and you're interjecting yourself into their problem. And it could, you know, you could see it. Oftentimes, oftentimes you can't. Everything is okay until you walk out that door. Then things change. So we're, we're going to look at domestic violence this week in this case. And I think you will learn something in investigations and in missing persons case. And you're going to learn what to do and you're going to learn what not to do. We're going to look at this from every angle, okay? We're going to look at it as, is Carrie possibly, is there a remote possibility she's still alive? Because in some cases there are. Think of Michelle Whitaker. Think of a case that I just did recently. Uh, Mara Murray. No body found. But victimology tells you a story there. Could that tell us the same type of so story or scenario here? Every story is different, but sometimes they're the same. And we got to look at every ounce of possibilities. Runaway, natural causes, domestic violence, dead, intruder, outsider, family member, someone close. All those things and we're gonna look into it with a very meticulous manner because all these cases deserve that remember that I always say you know it's never about the prosecution or the defense it's about the truth always it's always about the victim and the victims families always don't get it twisted always so this week, I'm dedicating this week to Carrie Culberson and her family, her friends, and her mom, Deborah Culberson. And we are going to figure out what happened to Carrie, and we're going to learn from this experience. And remember that. It's always a teachable and learnable moment. We're going to learn from that investigation. And as we go forward, remember, solved or unsolved, that's today. Tomorrow, Ken's Key Clue, that's on every Tuesday. Wednesday's the deep dive, everybody's favorite. Thursday's the live chat. I'm going to answer a lot of your questions, but I won't be able to get to all of them. But Friday, I will get to most of them because... Friday, I'll do the Q&A session from all your comments left on the case. So that's it. Solved or unsolved, you guys decide by the end of the week on this week's case, Carrie Culberson. So until tomorrow, Maine's out. Wow.